I would like to start by thanking Mass Humanities. Their support for the Bridge Street Initiative has made this lecture series possible. Tonight's talk, Native Natick in a Violent Century, 1650 to 1750, is the first of three lectures in our series titled Indigenous Histories and Futures in Natick, Massachusetts. The second event in this series will feature Professor Jean O'Brien speaking on her book, Thirsting and Lasting, Writing Indians Out of Existence in New England on October 19th at 6 p.m. Please note the earlier time for that one, it's at 6 p.m. The third and final event in the series will feature Nipmuc tribal historian and genealogist Pamela Ellis speaking on Indigenous Natick Today on December 14th at 7 p.m. If you are here tonight because of your interest in Natick during the 17th century, then we encourage you to register for the other talks in the series to better understand how the past lives on in the present. As a reminder, we will be taking questions via the chat function only. Please take a moment to locate the chat on your device and we encourage you to send questions to Nikki or me as hosts at, this, at any time during the talk. We will incorporate your questions into the conversation following Professor Mandel's presentation. And so I'm very delighted and honored to welcome our speaker tonight. Daniel Mandel is Professor of History Emeritus at Truman State University in Missouri, where he taught from 1999 to, two, to 2022. His most recent book, The Lost Tradition of Economic Equality in America, 1600 to 1870 was published in spring 2020. Most of Professor Mandel's work has focused on Native Americans in New England, including Behind the Frontier, Indians in 18th Century Eastern Massachusetts, King Philip's War, Colonial Expansion, Native Resistance, and the End of Indian Sovereignty, and Tribe Race History, Native Americans in Southern New England, 1780 to 1880, which was given the OAH Lawrence Levine Award for Best Book on American Cultural History. And now a final reminder to be sure you are viewing the presentation in speaker view. Now let's give Professor Mandel a warm but silent Zoom round of applause. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate the initiative and effort of the Native Historical Society in setting up this series of events um, and for inviting me to start things off with an account of Natick's first century. And I appreciate all of you coming to hear what I have to tell you. I also appreciate talking to you from the center of Nipponet, Nipmuc territory. Uh, I'm now living in Worcester, Massachusetts. Natick's origin is often depicted as a Christian Indian mission created by John Eliot, the Puritan, the Puritan minister who gained fame for those efforts in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, but in reality, the town was a partnership between Eliot and various Native Christians, particularly Wabin, who would lead the community as the region was transformed by the English invasion, and the terrible conflict commonly known as King Philip's War, 1675 to 1677. Wabin's son Thomas would continue leading Natick during the next four centuries as it adopted more aspects of colonial culture, including holding land in severalty, individual land holding, and uh, bringing in a Harvard trained minister, Oliver Peabody changes that unintentionally resulted in the rapid dominance of the town by Anglo-Americans. Now, when Wabin was born around 1600, the native peoples of Southern New England were just beginning to be affected by occasional encounters with European explorers, traders, and pirates. By the time he was an adult, Epidemics and increasing numbers of English colonists were reshaping native societies, economies, and politics. 
In the 1630s, with the uh, Puritan Great Migration, the large uh, immigration of, of many uh, English to uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony, following the pilgrims, so-called pilgrims to Plymouth Bay, uh, to the Plymouth Colony, um, the English came in such numbers that they soon rivaled those of native groups, particularly along the coast, and then established their power throughout southern New England by smashing the Pequots in a war that ended in 1637. Native and colonists increasingly lived near each other, and their encounters became more regular and frequent. The English began to hire natives to assist with farming or crafts. Colonial uh, authorities maneuvered to increase their authority in the region, uh, and conflicts over resources and power became more frequent. Settlers, English settlers, were surprised to find native strangers just simply walking into their houses without knocking or without invitation. Um, but this would as this was in accordance with native norms of hospitality. Wobbin himself later told, like other natives, told of going into native houses, into English houses, and then hastily leaving when their hosts started talking to them about Christianity. By the 1640s, Wobbin was a prominent man in his village of Nonantum, a village along the Charles River between the western edges of Watertown and Cambridge, now Newton, and that uh, bridge you see there is uh, the site of Nonantum. His village, his influence was highlighted, uh, perhaps increased, by his marriage to the daughter of a Neshoba sachem. And his village had developed connections with Nipmucks as well, uh, where they stayed while visiting or trading with the English in Boston and the town that became Cambridge. Those factors probably drew the Dorchester minister John Eliot to Nanantum, trying to find more, a more receptive audience for his early missionary efforts after uh, being scornfully rejected by the Massachusetts sachem Kachemkin and Neponsi. In, in 1647, Wobbin became the first to embrace Eliot's Puritan message, which included the need to take on many aspects of English civilized life, reading, writing, um, behaving in certain ways, dressing in English style clothing. Wobbin hosted Eliot for four additional meetings at which the minister preached to growing crowds of natives, including curious Nipmuc and Pawtucket visitors from further to the Northeast and convinced many to pledge their acceptance of Christianity and civilization. In 1651, the Massachusetts General Court, recognizing Eliot's success and the growing number of, uh, of natives who seemed to want to adopt this program, the General Court formally granted 2,000 acres for a Christian Indian town, straddling the Charles River 18 miles west of Boston near Nipmuc territory, including land actually carved from Dedham. Dedham and exchanged got land further west, which became the town of Deerfield, uh, which would be involved in that famous raid in 1704. And over the next few years, um, additional grants expanded the town threefold to 6,000 acres. Um, the aim was among the English was to make it a showcase and a training center for subsequent praying towns. Natives who went to live there gained material assistance, including funds to build an English style meeting house, a fort, and an arched footbridge across the Charles River. A Nitmuk man helped Eliot translate the Bible and other sacred literature into the Massachusetts language and then to print the works for the Indians to read, to use. The Christian Indians wore, they were marked really by English clothes, wearing English clothes and cutting their hair. Uh, other natives from the region got to know them in that way. They saw a native with short hair, they, they, they knew he was a Christian. And they enforced a legal code um, that uh, native judges and juries were involved in, in enforcing designed to bring them in line more with English social and political patterns, including sexual norms, um, getting rid of polygamy, and gender roles, 
For example, men were now expected to work in the fields, which had been the women's role in traditional uh, Aboriginal culture. At the same time, many customs in the community remained strong, including building wetus, wigwams, and living in those instead of cabins. Um, this is called syncretism, this kind of building a new culture that draws on at least two elements to create something that is unique. A Natick syncretic culture uh, is highlighted uh, actually by some of the burials found centuries later in which individuals, dead individuals were interred with wampum, spoons, beads, and other earthly items after one might guess a proper Puritan sermon. Um, this kind of middle ground between native and English uh, is also reflected in, uh, in a way, it's also reflected in native's governing structure. Eliot took the opportunity to implement uh, a, something unique, actually, a biblical structure uh, for the town based on Exodus chapter 18, verses 20 to 22, uh, naming 10 rulers of 10, two rulers of 50, and one ruler of 100. Uh, but the, the people who filled those roles were the traditional leaders, including Wabin, who was named the, one of the first rulers of 50, and Kachemkin, who actually decided uh, to join this, this effort and was named as the first ruler of 100, the Massachusetts Sachem. And what, they, what these traditional uh, rulers did, traditional leaders did, was to enforce old norms of community peace and stability in various ways. Uh, Wabin would become the town's undisputed leader and ruler of 100 when Kanshenkin died in 1655. Now, Wabin and others, why did they embrace this radical change, Christianity and these English ways of living? Um, well, these dramatic changes made sense to them in terms of how their world had been turned upside down by the effects of the English, the European and English invasion. A few years after uh, establishing Natick, he and others sought to gain authority um, the authority from the, 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 uh, the uh, colony, Massachusetts, to establish a church in the town by making public confessions of their spiritual journey to Christianity. Wabin was one of these, and their testimonies were recorded, uh, and we have them today. Uh, and they're really fascinating documents. Uh, we know that Wabin told the assemblage of Puritan elders that he had long been ambitious that decades earlier he had wished to be a witch, a uh, man of power, uh, and a sachem. He, he highlighted how the great sickness, um, this is actually, we, we know about this, this is the 1633 um, smallpox epidemic uh, recorded by a number of English colonists that had decimated native communities in terrible ways without sickening one, one colonist. And Wabin described how this great sickness had made him uh, consider and start to do what the English did because they had survived these, you know, they hadn't been touched by this sickness, whereas the Indians had been decimated by it. So he began to work in fields as a, as a farmer, um, even though that was traditionally women's work. Uh, but he found it really hard to do, of course. It's, it's, backbreaking stuff if you're not used to it. Uh, and so he wondered how the English, these are his words, he wondered how the English came to be so strong to labor and he feared he might die. So then he became more interested in this religion that seemed to provide support for the strength. He started to listen to Christianity and became interested in it. Other natives who testified spoke of similar experiences uh, that led them to believe that uh, Christianity offered explanations for the technologies, the power, uh, and even the ability to survive diseases that the English had. So in this way, Natick became the center and the seedbed for the mainland Christian Indian movement. The original inhabitants came from various villages and tribes in the region and often had kinship connections to other communities. Uh, Wabin, for example, was married to the daughter of the Neshoba Sachem. Some were Nipmucks, and they encouraged their relations to come visit and take back were, uh, the word of the English God. Uh, 
Native offered schooling and other encouragements of literacy, attracting many Indians, including John Sassamon of Massachusetts, born near the praying town of Punkapok, today uh, modern day Canton, Stoughton. Uh, Sassamon would teach at Natick before leaving to work as a secretary and teacher for the Wampanoag Sachems. By 1674, Natick had 29 families living there, about 194 people, and formed the core of a network of praying towns as Elliot sought to extend this mission by taking Christian Indian leaders to seven additional Nipmuc towns further west. Given its prominent role and location, it's not surprising that Natick would play a role in King Philip's War. The town's former teacher, John Sassamon, uh, earned a death sentence by warning the English that Philip Medicom, uh, the Wapanoag Sachem, was planning, uh, planning war against the English. And after he was killed, um, Plymouth arrested, tried, and executed three of Medicom's leading counselors uh, for that or that, that deed. Um, and that trial and execution sparked the war in late June, 1675. When Wampanoag warriors attacked the town of Swansea uh, within Philip's territory, um, men from Natick joined the Massachusetts force uh, that went to save the town and to pursue Medicom. In August, 1675, the killing spread as Nipmucks, including some Christians, attacked English outposts in their territory. The colonists became increasingly fearful of the Christian natives in their midst, and on August 30th, confined all friend Indians to Natick and four other praying towns. Finally, on October 30th, everyone in Natick was forced from their homes and put in prison essentially on Deer Island in Boston Harbor, which became a concentration camp for Christian Indians, as others from other, for people from other praying towns were forced there over the next few months. In the middle of the winter, with little clothing or shelter and almost no, no food, many died. Despite English hostility and abuse, the men on the island clamored to help in the war against Medicom. They had thrown in their lot with the English, with the Christians. And after the general court finally approved native enlistment, in spring 1676, about 100 Indian men from the island contributed their critical scouting and fighting skills to the colonial victory, though at the time their families had to remain on the island. At the end of the war, Wabin led most of the survivors of Deer Island first to Nonanta, where they stayed for about a year under watchful English eyes, and then back to Natick, which became the largest Indian community in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Those who resettled Natick came from various pre-war communities. The end of the war did not mean an end to the community's tribulations. Many of the colonists remained suspicious and hostile. Some sought to cheat the Indians of land and resources, like the two men who bought 200 remote acres within Natick in 1682, and then somehow managed to claim not 200, but 1,700 acres. Or the fellow who took a deed for 50 acres and tried adding another zero to the document claiming 500 acres. The general court for several years also required all Indians to remain in Natick or two or three other identified praying towns. And similar limitations would be reimposed when new wars erupted on Massachusetts boundaries. They even faced ongoing threats from the feared Mohawks who saw no need to end their campaign against Indians in the region. Uh, 20, uh, Nitmuk, uh, 20, 20 Natick Indians uh, were taken in 1682 from the nearby town of uh, McGunquag as they were uh, working in the fields there by Mohawks. Natick's population would decline to about 200 people by the end of the 17th century, but it was still an entirely Indian town. Had more inhabitants than before the war because these other communities went to Natick after the war ended and remained in Indian town until the 1730s. Elliot's political structure did not survive the war. Although Wabin, Biambo, 
uh, the former deacon of the Nipmuc Church in Hassana Misset, Nipmuc community, uh, and Thomas Trey, those three, were identified in post-war documents as rulers. They seem more of a, of a council uh, or a court. All three claimed kinship or other connections to various other Christian native communities. Also prominent in the community were three other men uh, whose titles were not given um, within the structure, but were apparently uh, served as counselors to the three top men. This included uh, the man who is now minister, uh, Daniel Takawampe. More about him in a minute. Wabin remained one of the town's principal leaders until his death sometime between the fall of, 1980, of 1681 uh, and 1684 possibly during an epidemic that began uh, in 1683 and ran through the early winter, 1684. During the 1680s, town meetings or gatherings of large factions within the town seemed to play a large, uh, growing role, and in part because of Natick's diverse population, but particularly in response to a series of controversies over land. The controversies initially involved the supposedly abandoned Nipmuc territory in the midst of a colony where I'm speaking from now. A 1677 council of native leaders from many pre-war communities uh, were unified in condemning various sales made by uh, a, a, a Nimic Indian named John Wamp Wampus, uh, who, uh, who uh, um, was trying to sell land and make money. He was kind of a confidence man. Uh, there's a wonderful book actually on John Wampus published a, a year or two ago uh, by Jennifer Pulsifer. But the unity of this council and of the community seemed to dissolve in 1681 when Nipmuc survivors, many living in Natick, sought to resettle their ancestral homes and sell surplus land, while others who were not Nipmucs also looked to gain from that territory. The resulting dealings show at least three factions in Natick that reflected post-war division, pre-war divisions rather, between villages. In 1682, after the controversy was resolved, a general meeting in Natick agreed not to sell any of the supposedly abandoned praying towns without the consent of everyone in the community. Thus the move just two years later by 10 Natick Indians to sell various praying towns drew a sharp and ultimately effective protest by a larger group led by Minister Takwampe and actually John Elliott joined the protest as well. Internal tensions were also apparent within the town's church. By 1683, John Elliott had trained and ordained Takawampeit. A few years later, the Puritan minister, Elliott, was unable to continue his regular visits, and he finally died in 1690. On the other hand, Daniel, uh, Daniel Gookin Jr. Uh, Daniel Gookin was the Indian superintendent before the war who worked with John Elliott and um, kind of um, supervised uh, native courts. Uh, and Daniel Gookin's son, Daniel Gookin Jr., had become minister in the neighboring town of Sherbert and maintained these connections and knew the language um, of the native people and came to preach there once a month funded by uh, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, an English uh, missionary society that had uh, uh, governing officials in, in Massachusetts. We have no record of how Takawambe and others felt, but they wouldn't have been very happy uh, that many English from Sherburn came to hear Gukin's sermons, because uh, apparently he sometimes did preach in English. Others in Natick, other Natick Indians, did prefer Gukin and actually uh, sought funds from Massachusetts to help pay him to preach more often and specifically to preach in English. Elsewhere in the region, Christian Indian communities insisted on having ministers who spoke their language and only their language and preferred those who shared their culture. Massachusetts authorities did support Gukin in part because, well, they liked the idea of getting natives to learn more English, to use English, uh, but they also disliked, we don't know the details, they disliked something about what Tom Kwampe was doing in the church. Uh, perhaps he was incorporating Aboriginal rituals 
into services. Uh, this was actually happening on the Indian uh, church, Christian Indian church on Nantucket, a pipe sharing ritual that was later described by English visitors. And perhaps this was happening in Nating as well. Natick's post-war culture and economy certainly showed, perhaps like this pipe sharing ceremony that was taking place in Natick, may have happened in, in, in Nantucket, may have been happening in Natick, um, showed that kind of mixture of English and indigenous elements. Like their English neighbors, men held property apparently in perpetuity and passed it on to their sons. At the same time, the town maintained stronger communal authority over land ownership and use than in a typical New England town. And most importantly, land was not treated as a commodity. And it was rarely sold to outsiders. And when it was, the entire community had to get permission. Indian families continued living in wigwams rather than cabins. And a visitor in 1685 reported, reported many of them still wearing buckskins and beads rather than woven cloth. Um, this testimony is a little suspicious, but it's an indication of how Native people may have been continuing to combine these elements. Indeed, men often left the, the, the town, we know this from, from a number of court documents, uh, to, uh, to trap beaver and hunt deer. There was an active deerskin um, uh, market at the time. Uh, deerskin, by the way, were used for to bind books in the late 17th into 18th century. Um, and many Natick and, and Natick men were involved in shooting deer and selling their skins. Or they some of them went to work for English farmers. Uh, definite labor shortage in the area and their labor was generally quite welcome. Uh, wasn't quite welcome to their Dedham neighbors, however. Dedham had always had problems with Natick right from the beginning. And in the 1680s, 1690s, uh, there were petitions from Dedham to the general court complaining that strange Western Indians were visiting Natick and that the Natick Indians were, were proud and sure and surly, um, refusing to take notice of an Englishman if they meet him in the street. And here I'm kind of picturing these arrogant English insisting that a native uh, get off the sidewalk when they walk by. Uh, it seems to be the kind of tone of these petitions. Uh, and then the, the, they complained that the, Eng that the Indians would not plant corn for themselves. And this is a quote from the petition, refused to work for the English except on unreasonable terms. In reality, you know, Natick had had problems with Dedham since its creation. Uh, indeed, in 1698, the English town surveyed its border with the Native community and in the process managed to steal about 1,400 acres from Natick, according to the Indians later, uh, including many orchards and cornfields. On the other hand, the Indians did have good relations with the neighboring town of Sherburn. Uh, many of the, 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 the trade in deerskins involved uh, men from Sherburn. And uh, Sherburn neighbors were, were happy to hire uh, Natick men to work in the fields and to pay whatever wages were being asked uh, by them. The general court, uh, showed more appreciation for the persistence of traditional uh, Native masculine skills uh, after the war with Wabanakis resumed in 1689, recruiting many from Natick and other villages to serve as scouts and soldiers. And this would happen again and again during the 18th century as well, where the Massachusetts General Court high, uh, um, looks toward Native men from Natick uh, to serve in, um, in colonial uh, units. Noticeable changes came to Natick with the new century after 1700, many involving Wabin's son Thomas. Thomas, born around 1630, stood at his father's side when Elliot began preaching in Nonantum and was sent to school in Dedham. It's not clear when he returned to Natick, but after Wabin's death, he became one of the most prominent leaders of the community. Around 1700, he began documenting important events in the town, initially in the Massachusetts language and later in English, uh, which meant Natick became the only Indian community during this period to produce such records. It's unique. Uh, 
By 1707, Thomas was recording annual elections of Natick officers. Uh, by then, they were electing selectmen, constables, and other officers just like their English neighbors did, and unlike any other Native community in the region. Thomas provided no explanation for this change, but as before, the same individuals and members of families who had led the community under the older system were elected to serve in these new uh, these new positions. Thomas himself served as town clerk, of course, and was regularly elected one of the selectmen for the town. One motivation for these changes may have been the growing English population that increasingly felt secure enough to move into lands around and west of Natick, leaving the Indian, more, Indian town more isolated behind the frontier. In 1703, the Massachusetts Indian commissioner found few whites in Natick in 1703, but by 1715, 12 years later, the Indians were sufficiently worried about their presence and the growing demand for wood from Boston, so they banned selling timber to Englishmen. Colonial elites felt secure enough to try meddling in Natick for the first time, urging widespread land allotments to encourage moral improvements and suggesting trying to get natives from Hassanamissa and Punkapok to move, to move to Natick. No one was interested. The town was more receptive when those officials brought John Nesnuman, Nesnuman, Nesnuman the renowned Sandwich Indian uh, minister, Wampanoag, to preach in the church. And in July 17th, after Takawambe's death, they welcomed him to take the pulpit. So there's a new Indian minister in town. Unfortunately, Nisnuman followed his predecessor in paradise just two years later. Wabin's son was probably also involved in the dramatic decision by Natick in 1719 to copy uh, neighboring towns by creating a proprietorship to make formal uh, recorded allotments of property in the town, which meant they no longer had to get permission from the entire community to sell pieces of those allotments. They only had to get permission. This is under uh, the provincial law. They had to get permission from the general court to sell these lands, um, but tended to be just rubber stamp permission. Um, the first 20 proprietors, 19 men and one women, were apparently the heads of long established and prestigious families. Uh, they met separately from the town as a whole and each agreed to take 60, uh, 60 acre plot uh, within the community. Wabin and other educated Datic leaders knew that such arrangements provided secure land titles and boundaries under colonial law. This may have been one reason why they did it. In addition, this change facilitated economic development by allowing proprietors to more easily sell land holdings to Englishmen uh, without community permission. In fact, the initial wave of land sales by Natick Indians after this 1719 division were done in order to buy cattle, um, farming tools, and barns. They also bought large amounts of English consumer goods for their new homes. As inventories from the 1740s from Natick Indians show beds and bedding, chests, chairs, tables, iron, brass, kitchenware, and pewterware, and even mirrors. These were, these were almost luxury goods. But the shift proved to be a disaster to the community by connecting it more closely to the ebb and flow of the province's legal and economic systems. Prices of land and crops decreased during the 1730s relative to the price, relative to the, relative to the cost of cattle and tools. Therefore, more, more land had to be sold for those same needs. And the crops raised with the new technology as the land became exhausted, garnered less. Those who initially sold land to finance material improvements soon found themselves having to sell even more land in order to pay debts. For example, in 1729, Jacob Chalcom asked to sell 32 acres in order to build, quote, a dwelling house after the English manner for his more comfortable living. Just two years later, he needed to sell more land in order to pay debts from building that house and debts from buying a horse, oxen, and a cow 
And in 1739 and 1741, he had to sell a total of 60 acres to finish paying for that barn. Clearly, despite Chalcombe's initiative and energy, he, like many other Natick Indian men, had problems making it in the colonial economy. Ecological changes in the region, driven by colonial population growth, played a factor in rising land sales, as many Natick Indians sought to sell land in order to build uh, one of these English style homes, uh, because as Samuel Abraham noted in 1726, it was becoming increasingly difficult to find the materials uh, to build wigwams. The increasing number of individual sales also opened the doors to colonists getting land through intimidation, manipulation, and fraud. Another significant milestone in Natick's transformation was the installation of, a, of an English minister. In August 1721, shortly before Thomas Wobbin's death, Harvard graduate Oliver Peabody began preaching in, in Natick. Unlike Mashby, which during the same period resisted an English minister, a white minister, the Natick Indians accepted Peabody, perhaps because they lacked a native alternative or perhaps he seemed a useful connection uh, to the power and support of provincial elites. In February 1723, Harvard agreed, Harvard College agreed to pay Peabody 40 pounds a year uh, to serve as Natick's minister. The Indians granted him a very large parcel of land in the town, and he became one of the first whites to settle there as he became their minister. Strains developed rapidly as Peabody preached only in English and sought to bring more whites into the church and the town. In 1729, visiting provincial officials found that as many whites as Indians were attending the church. Um, there were Indian there were white families from neighboring towns who would come in uh, to the to the to Natick to attend the church because it was closer. There were at that point only eight white families uh, living in Natick, and they were outnumbered by natives. Indians in the towns that they disliked worshiping among the English, and the officials noticed quote some difficulty during the service when Peabody asked a white man to read a psalm. Peak Indian membership during uh, Peabody's ministry reached only 15% of native residents compared to nearly 30% of whites. The rising volume of land sales along with Peabody in the pulpit brought a flood of English settlers in the native and they became a majority in the 1730s. Reports from Anglo visitors, along with Peabody's systematic recording of vital records in the town, allow a unique comparison of native and English demographics during that period. In 1729, um, there were only eight, eight English and 30 Indian families in the town, but by the early 1740s, there were nearly 40 English families in the town. Indians and English married at about the same age, interestingly enough, through uh, 1785. Uh, men married at uh, the average age, native or non-native, about 24.8 years. The men married uh, and women tended to marry at age uh, 23.7. That's a lot older than we would expect, uh, but those were the norms, in fact, at the time. Yet natives had a much lower fertility or child survival rate than did the English. Only 2.5 children among Natick Indians survived to adulthood, compared to five for neighboring Dedham and 5.3 for a more distant Andover during the same period. Death rates were very, very high for Indians. Compare the number of births with deaths. You can see, just to make it a little clearer, notice these are the Indian births on the left, Indian deaths on the right uh, every five years. Uh, notice the figures um, until the 1740s. Natick's native population was replenished by the immigration of Indians from other villages, often kinfolk. But that was insufficient with these kinds of ratios. That was inf insufficient to maintain the Indian majority in the town. Wartime casualties were particularly devastating. Uh, I already mentioned that Natick men often served in colonial units. And during King George's War, 1744 to 45, this was 
uh, particularly apparent. Um, they brought back disease to the town and uh, 46 Indians and Natick died in an epidemic during that period. The number of Natick men fell to, during this same period during the wartime to nearly half that of women. And in the patriarchal agrarian economy, women were greatly dependent on adult men to raise the crops that provided food and income. The 1749 census listed 11 widows, nearly 20% of all women. These statistics point to why native, uh, the native populations in Natick and other Indian communities in the region shrank so terribly during uh, the mid-century. Given the native community's high mortality rate, low birth rates, injuries and illness, individuals had to sell land in order to pay debts for medical care and from being incapacitated. Disease and farm accidents forced only three families in the late 1720s to sell land, but in the 1730s, nine men sold pieces of their family's inheritance to pay medical debts. Debtor's prison became a major threat. Um, in 1737, Thomas Pegan Jr. sold land to pay his medical debts. Two years later, his father was forced to sell more land in order to get his son out of debtor's jail in Charleston. Yet just as more Natick Indians had to sell more land to simply survive, the rural economy in Massachusetts slumped further. Uh, land lost in, on average more than half of its value. This meant, and I'm gonna go a little more quickly here, um, natives left Natick. There'd always been connections between native communities, people moved in and out. Uh, Jeannie O'Brien's book, uh, Natick Dispossessed, does a wonderful job of tracing these connections. But in the 1740s, movement was increasingly simply out of Natick. And a lot of the land sale requests during this time was uh, people living, natives living in Worcester or Dudley or Sturbridge, see, selling their lands in Natick in order to support themselves in these new towns. At literally the same time, the town's Anglo population rose steeply with the annexation of Hog End. Uh, the, a part of Needham extending deep into the eastern middle of Natick, and I've outlined it with a red line in this map. Although the general court initially rejected that move, uh, it approved the action in 1744 after petitioners agreed not to move the town's meeting house away from its current location. Uh, the addition meant that the number of whites in Natick increased to nearly 70% of all residents, nearly sixfold since 1729. A few months later, the English petitioned the general court asking to be put in, created, uh, incorporated into a separate township, i.e. from the Indians. In January 1746, the general court transformed legally the Indian plantation into a parish, which made it a, a religious community instead of a political entity. In the wake of this decision, whites gained complete domination of Natick's government. Not one Indian after this um, achieved office in the town and the Indian population continued to increase. By 1764, a census reported only 450, uh, uh, reported only 37 whites, sorry, reported 37 Indians in Natick compared to 450 whites in the town. Dramatic change since 1730. Those who remained in Natick would have increasingly felt oppressed by the rising Anglo majority, especially as English ethnocentrism evolved into racism. Professor O'Brien will discuss next month, tune in October 29th, October 19th rather. Um, in the next century, Anglo antiquarians who began to write histories of towns like Natick largely dismissed natives as completely or nearly extinct ignoring those who remained, but did not fit the hardening stereotypes of primitive Indians. More about that on October 19th. In the late 1640s, Wabin and other natives had embraced Puritan Christianity in a new community after experiencing the terror of smallpox and other convulsive changes to their world. 
Over the subsequent century, they and their descendants dealt with wars, imprisonment, exile, resettlement, more death, disease, and finally inundation and marginalization by Anglo settlers. A few Indian communities in the region, notably Mashpee and Aquina, Gayhead, managed to avoid these evils by maintaining clear physical and cultural boundaries. But unfortunately in Natick, these critical boundaries dissolved when the Indians began selling land, first in their efforts to prosper and then in their struggle to survive. I'll take your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Mendel. We really appreciate the talk and uh, learning so much about this critical time in the development of, of Natick. Um, I, I, uh, I'll note now that if you have questions, you can send them via the chat function to Gail Coughlin, one of our co-hosts. Co um, you can see uh, her name pop up when you click on the chat bubble. Um, before we begin our q and I, I want to offer thanks again to Mass Humanities and the Bridge Street Fund, uh, which has made this lecture series possible. And I also want to thank our supporters whose contributions uh, keep us going at the Natick Historical Society. And if, if you've learned something here tonight and would like to learn more, I encourage you to check out our website, natickhistoricalsociety.org, uh, and consider making a donation. Um, so with that, I'll encourage all for uh, to send their questions to Gail via the chat function. Um, you can, I know a, a couple are sending to me and, and that's totally fine too. Um, Gail, if you've got any questions to start us off, uh, feel free to jump in. Sure. So I just want to echo Nikki's thanks to Dr. Mandel for that really fantastic presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, so we do have a few questions. So I guess to start off, um, in the 17th and 18th centuries, how would you get from a frontier town like Natick to Boston? Was the Charles River fully um, navigable? Good question. And I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, I, I uh, it was navigable as far as I'm aware. Um, I'm remembering accounts of people canoeing between Natick and further and, and down river. Um, but there are also, um, as this map shows, there were roads as well. Um, so I would guess you both would work. Um, the, the, the Charles kind of wanders a bit. Um, it may be that the roads, I mean, I, the roads were significant, um, connecting Connecticut to Massachusetts, connect, and then heading and going west and so on. And Natick was at the, was located where these roads um, uh, uh, where one could find these kinds of roads. So while the river may have been navigable, I would guess that people use the roads as well. Mm. Thank you. I'm gonna have to look for the answer for that one or someone will, <laughs> oh, will find it for me and send it to me. All right. So can you speak to any indentured servitude and slavery and how did that shape life in Natick really throughout the town's early history? Um, there were some uh, African Americans enslaved people in Natick. Um, I believe, let me go back to the that census, which of course is not, um, I thought I had some, some enslaved, uh, some blacks in that as well. I have to look for that. Uh, there were some, I know that, um, but not many in Natick, um, which was kind of typical for rural villages, um, usually the minister and just of the peace perhaps in a town would have one or two or three enslaved people uh, to help, uh, but <laughs> as a sign of uh, prestige, actually owning humans was prestigious. 
Um, and then it was additional help so that the minister could write sermons, visit with uh, people in the parish, and Justice of the Peace could deal with the things they needed to deal with. And so they would use these, uh, they'd have people to do the work around the house and, and in the garden in the fields. Um, indentured servitude, that seems to me more common in other parts for, for Native people. Um, in the 18th century, it definitely becomes a major problem in some towns, uh, particularly along the coast um, and in Worcester County. Um, I am not familiar, I'm not aware of it, much of it in Natick as at that point. It may have been because you had the Native community here that was fairly strong, uh, fairly prominent. And so there wasn't the, the, the need or desire um, for that. Uh, intended to, to I, I'm aware of that happening a lot, unfortunately, in Plymouth County, um, Barnstable County, um, but not as much in Middlesex County um, or, the, or, or Natick itself. All right. So were like any indigenous peoples themselves enslaved or indentured, especially around the time of King Philip's War or after? Oh, that, yes. Excuse me. Um, there were a lot, a large number of, of Wampanoag and uh, Massachusetts and Nipmuc people. Um, some of them captured in the war. They were sold off and slaved down to the West Indies, um, where the English were growing sugar and needed the labor, and we're happy to get more people uh, to run through that grinder. Um, and then of course, it was punishment for having been traitors to the colony and to be captured in war. Uh, under the English uh, and New England biblical code, it was considered acceptable to en enslave war captives, right? Um, there were some Christian Indians as well though, who found themselves packed off into slavery. Um, and uh, that's a definitely a sordid chapter in, in the history of New England. Um, there's actually some, uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, there's been new connections developed between the descendants of those enslaved people uh, in Bermuda, Bermuda, I believe, and some other islands, uh, and Massachusetts, Native people in, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Um, I'm not completely up on the figures of folks who had been in the praying Indian communities, including Natick, who wound up enslaved. Um, most of them wound up, at least the, the older praying towns outside of Nipmuc territory, uh, wound up on Deer Island um, mm -hmm. and were not enslaved. Right, they were imprisoned on Deer Island and then released. Right, thank you. And I guess to add to that slavery question, um, so you said that indigenous peoples were looking for work on colonial farms. Was that always free labor or was that sometimes enslavement or indentured servitude? Uh, the indentured servitude on the mainland tended to be uh, children. Mm. That was much more common. Um, David Silverman wrote a wonderful article, I think in the New England Quarterly about that terrible trend, um, where if the, and you can kind of picture this happening with Natick's high death rate, right, among the adults. Uh, if a widow had five children and couldn't manage to raise them um, or if white observers and just of the peace or the minister felt she was not doing a good job of raising them, then the white authorities could take them away from, take the child or children away from her and put them into an indenture with white households to raise them in white households and of course provide labor for that white household at the same time. That mm -hmm. kind of arrangement was, was not uncommon along the coast for whalers, where a lot of men from the Wampanoag communities on Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and Cape Cod wound up in indentures um, because of debts and having to go to sea working for whalers, 
Um, the, the men, adult men who worked as farm laborers, however, inland did tend to do it for wages, uh, not, not out of indenture, not out of slavery. That's the large pattern. There were always exceptions, but the larger pattern is they were doing it for wages. Well, thank you. And is there a place where we can find more information about the link between New England and Bermuda in terms of um, enslavement? Um, I know there are websites about that. Um, the connections that have recently been um, uh, re have been forged, right? Um, so you would look in, uh, I believe the Narragansetts and uh, the Aquinas have been particularly active in, in this. Um, probably the best work, I don't, actually don't know if it's out yet. Um, oh, I'm beginning to feel my age. Fisher um, from uh, Brown University. Linford Fisher. Thank you. Yes, Linford. Uh, Linford is working on a book. Um, I don't know its current status, how close it is to publication. Uh, and that is the book of, that, that will deal particularly with that, um, that slavery, uh, that, that part of the picture. Um, uh, Newell, um, Newell, Newell, Newell from uh, um, Ohio. Oh, Margaret Ellen Thank you. Newell. Yeah, Margaret Newell wrote a very good book uh, on this larger question of Indian slavery in New England. So that's kind of a larger picture, and it does have sections in it, large sections about um, what happens during King Philip's War with people being sold down into slavery down in the South. And it also has information about pieces about the indentures that's going on and so on. So that's Thank another you. very good book. And that's out, mm -hmm. that's been out for a few years. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of John Elliott questions. So somebody's wondering if John Elliott preached in a native language or if he used an interpreter. Initially he used an interpreter, but he learned the native language um, fairly quickly. Um, and got better over time. Uh, he was taught by a captive from the Pequot Wars um, before he first tried preaching. I think he had an interpreter the first time he went out, uh, first couple times perhaps he went out, but he was able to learn and um, at a certain point switched over to preaching in native language. Thank you. And was there any evidence of how later pastors um, were trained at seminaries? Were they trained similarly or differently to how John Eliot was trained? Well, Eliot was trained in England. Um, I, don't, I don't remember at the moment whether it's Cambridge or Oxford. Um, none of the native ministers were trained in, in either the English schools, but of course, Harvard was established um, when the folk, when the Puritans came to Massachusetts Bay, one of the first things they did was to establish Harvard in order to train ministers that were more in line with um, their kind of reformed version of Christianity. And so there were native men who went to Harvard. There was actually an Indian college built and uh, was there for a while and then was torn down after King Philip's, uh, a few years after King Philip's War. Um, it wasn't a very successful effort to train Indian ministers at Harvard. There were just a, a handful um, that went through that. Um, but that was that was what was it, it, the, when natives like Takawambe did get their training as ministers. Um, they didn't. I don't think they went through the same classes and structure as the colonists did but they were trained and they were ordained and they knew their Bible and so on and so forth. Thank you. And why are there so many different spellings of Takawambe's name? Do you know where all those come from? Um, well, it's phonetic spelling, right? So um, however, he, he I, I'm not even sure how he or his compadres pronounced it at the time, but we have these writings of, of Englishmen basically 
trying to write down the name as it sounds, right? The same thing is true um, if you look at uh, uh, Hanukkah. Okay, it's uh, yeah. there's like five or six different common spellings of Hanukkah. Um, that's because it's a word in Hebrew, and there's different ways of spelling that in English. It's based on the sound. Thank you. And Nikki mentioned that she is receiving some questions as well. I don't know if we have time for those, if you want to jump in, Nikki. So I think um, I've got a few over here, but I think I, I, maybe we'll just do one more um, looking at the clock. And um, for those of you who sent more specific questions, I will hold those um, and um, and uh, know that I have them. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so a, a more general question is about Lake Kachichuit and um, if that's familiar to you and if you have any sense of um, uh, what role the lake may have played in, in sort of Natick's uh, economy and in cultural retention. Is that something that? That is a piece of local history of which I am woefully ignorant. Okay, so, we can please that, enlighten me. <laughs> um, so we'll come back to that question because uh, that, that's something that, uh, unless Gail, you wanna take, take a crack at this, but it's something that we've talked with Wayland Historical Society about as well, since um, Gail, any particular? Uh, I don't think I can think of anything right now. Maybe yeah. send it in as a research request and yeah. I can give you a fuller answer that way. <laughs> Yes, it certainly um, plays a, a large role in the much longer span of history of this region and a native presence in this reason, region. And uh, if you visit the Kichijuit Rail Trail, you'll see we've got a sign on it with um, some of the geological history of, of that lake. Um, but bringing it into the 17th uh, and 18th century, I think, uh, is a great question and one that uh, we can we can address along with Wayland Historical Society. And um, Finally, this, this may be uh, a bit more local too, but um, uh, maybe could you say anything more about Oliver Peabody and uh, the land uh, which was granted to him? Um, and I, I think we're looking for any information about Peabody. The location or, um, let's see, they grant, um, hmm. I would need to check my my notes. Um, and I think it's not not so much land, and we can help you with that through a research request, sort of plotting plotting it too. Um, uh, but maybe we'll we'll come back to that one. I think we're getting I'm getting us into a little bit of the weeds here. So maybe maybe at that point we'll we'll stop. And um, I know I've got some more specific questions here, and I'll hold those, and Gail and I will take them up um, at, at a later point. Um, uh, does that does that work for you, Professor Mandel? Sure. I actually do have a, a, a sentence later on in an article I wrote that uh, uh, apparently the natives continued giving Peabody some land so that by 1740, he owned about 5% of the town. Uh, that would be that would be before Hog End got added to the town area. Um, but that's all I know. And this is right in the region of where South Natick Center is today. Um, for, the, for those of you who know. That would make sense, yeah. sure. Yeah, right. Well, um, I think at that point, we, we, we've um, taken advantage of your time here going well past eight o'clock. Um, so I think, um, you know, Gail and I, I know this was a huge treat to have you join us here this evening, Professor Mandel. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you who joined us uh, for this talk. We, we appreciate your interest and um, look forward to seeing you for the next two. Um, Thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to the sessions to come. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night. Yes. Thank you. Good night, everybody.